Welcome everyone uh, to the second session of UNESCO's 50 Minds for the Next 50. This roundtable series is a key initiative within the 50th anniversary celebration of the World Heritage Convention. Over the past five decades, the convention has transformed the way we value and protect heritage as our shared treasures of humanity. As we enter the next 50 years, unprecedented environmental and social challenges await. Crises of global magnitude require participation on expertise well beyond the conservation field. In this spirit, we kicked off the 50 Mind session on 24th May, where diverse thinkers explore the impact of climate crisis on heritage. During this session, Fatima Alzela, a Kuwaiti youth climate leader said, <clears throat> and I quote, the main challenge in the field of climate change is time. We don't have enough time or technologies that allow us to act effectively against climate change. What is the potential as well as the limitation of technology is remaining in, in remaining heritage protection and appreciation? That's a question. They are important and at times confronting questions. Likely we have here today some pioneers of the digital transformation, as well as thinkers who explore the impact of the digital revolution on our society. On this note, it is my pleasure to kickstart the second session of the 50 Minds for the next 50 titled Imagining Heritage in the Digital Dimension. Great. Thank you, UNESCO Assistant Director General for Culture, Mr. Ernesto Ottoni. My name is Rochelle Rokahasham here at UNESCO Culture Sector, and I'm going to be the host of this exciting discussion for the next two hours. It's going to be a really dynamic, a rich exchange. It's going to be interdisciplinary, and uh, Ernesto helped us set the framework for all the discussion we're going to have our 50 minds for the next 50. And we're going to have six short dialogues that are going to be 20 minutes each. So each one of these dialogues will have two of our esteemed thinkers. And um, we're going to be discussing the next 50. Our first two speakers are going to be Kanga and Chance Kukenor. Ms. Kat Waronga is a highly respected Filipina-French tech entrepreneur. She's the former director of La French Tech, and she is a board member of the European Innovation Council. So she has been working to leverage innovation and ideas to benefit our communities and to benefit all of us as individuals. And Chance Kukenor is uh, an American digital archaeologist. He is the head of preservation at Google Arts and Culture. So through digital reconstruction, Chance has been reviving and preserving heritage that is, for example, lost in conflicts or emergency situations, for example, uh, in Mosul, in Iraq. So to begin, we're going to turn it over to Kat and to Chance. They're going to have a dialogue, and I'm going to pass the mic over to you, Kat, so that you could ask your first question to Chance, and then you guys can feed off of each other's exchanges, and uh, I'll stop you at about 19 minutes, 20 minutes. Thanks so much. Go ahead. <laughs> So this is actually the first time I'm speaking with Chance. Okay. Hello, Chance. Uh, I mean, I had to start when, when I was first told uh, that we interviewed each other on so Is There's like this sort of eight-year-old inside me. And I was like, oh, why did I say I wanted to be a digital archaeologist <laughs> um, when, I, when I wrote? Well, can you maybe, maybe tell, uh, yeah, there's something about it that sounds really magical and I shared it. Maybe you could tell uh, the audience a little bit, like what does a digital archaeologist do and why is that work so important today in 2022? Yeah, sure. So digital archaeology is really just the next stage in what archaeology has been developed as a, as a field of expertise over the last uh, almost 100 to 150 years. But <clears throat> now it's focusing on using digital technology in ways 
that weren't accessible or even available um, even 10, 15, 20 years ago. So um, digital archaeology could be um, creating 3D models of uh, archaeology sites. It could be 3D uh, laser scanning objects and uh, putting those online to make them accessible to the public, as well as um, also maybe using machine learning to do things that um, it would really take a large army of archaeologists to figure out. When you have a lot of data, is my point, when you have a lot of data to um, to kind of synthesize and, re and record, machine learning can help, uh, you know, uh, go through and, and interpret that information in a more uh, accessible way. So is this like the equivalent of the shift from say, you know, paper news to digital news? Are we looking at something more groundbreaking here? And I guess the question that I really want to ask is I think, you know, I did some proper stalking on LinkedIn and uh, it did seem that 10 years ago, <laughs> you were still a student at the University of Stuttgart and a lot of things have happened in, in 10 years. So, you know, you, you talked about you know, machine learning, but you know, there's also like VR, video games, uh, metaverse. Um, like how, yeah. is, how has tech really changed, uh, you know, the field of digital archaeology? Are we looking at incremental changes or something that's really, uh, that's really game changing for everyone? I think it's I think it's both incremental, but then there are moments when the technology has just went over the next level and it's unlocked the power of putting taking people to an archaeology site deep in the past in a virtual kind of metaverse is the word that you use like in a, in a virtual environment and world um, that you couldn't do in uh, previously. So from an incremental perspective, photography really changed the, the kind of the, the world in terms of being able to take photographs of cultural heritage sites and archaeology sites. And this was invented in, in France um, about uh, 150 uh, years ago, or about 100 years ago. And so that gave people the ability to, rather than a painter painting their interpretation of a building or an object, it removed the subjective visual representation of an object. And it gave them the ability to, to, to do that. But fast forward to today when all of a sudden, maybe it was five years ago that you could start putting a, your phone into what were called Google Cardboards then, um, so that you could just put your phone in a cardboard and you could instantly be virtually you know, um, in, a, in, a, in a new location and explore it. That was one stage, and I think now where VR and AR and XR and these other acronyms um, are taking us is really some exciting, exciting ways um, that people can can also do uh, archaeological work. Not uh, they don't need to be tied to the field, and they don't need to transport objects anywhere. They can scan an object; it can stay in that country, and then they can three D print it even before they get back home, uh, back in the lab. So you could actually have copies of these objects. So the original objects stay in museums. And there's a lot of, obviously there's a lot of uh, interpretation and a lot of uh, um, positivity on where that, where that comes. But yeah, it's really the digital realm of, uh, of the ancient past. The digital realm of the ancient past, it sounds like it's going to be a movie soon. Uh, yeah. You, 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 yeah. So could I could I jump in too? And I was wondering um, if Chance, you you have a question related to that for Kat, and and yeah, and then she can yeah, maybe, sure, she, Kat maybe yes. you want to react on some mm -hmm. of that. Thanks. Sorry, I just got carried away. No, that's it's okay. Sure. <laughs> sure. So, since we're on the topic of kind of digital heritage and conservation and archaeology. You know, I, I've also looked into some of uh, the things that you've been doing, Kat, mm -hmm. over the years. And, uh, you know, from a, and, and, and the work that you did in, uh, in the, for the uh, government of France uh, with mm -hmm. tech initiatives. So I wanted to kind of go more into the tech ecosystem with a question here, uh, more about what, like, you've worked in creating inclusive and, and uh, you know, and diverse tech uh, ecosystem in France and, and not just in France, uh, in Europe and globally, really. How would you apply you, this vision or this, this uh, idea of how you've been, um, how you've been applying that for digital heritage conservation, which is such an important topic that like Ernesto mentioned in his opening. I, I mean, 
Yeah, so I was the director of the uh, French government startup initiative called the French Tech for quite a while. And, and the funny thing about the French Tech is that it's actually really, really, really small. You know, like the tech ecosystem is tiny. They usually like mostly founders of Mojo, they're going to school together, you know, in the same cities, and that's, you know, that sort of thing, right? And, um, and, and, you know, right around the time that I was starting, we had this one question, like, this is really like to be a bubble in us as a policymaker, as a leader from government, as like, part of the ecosystem, but the really thing that's in vision. Um, and around the same time, I also had this goal that was given to me by the president in 2018, to start president of France um, in 2018, which was to ensure that France becomes one of the best places in the world for startups to stay and grow, right? Um, at that time, there were three unicorns or three companies with valuations that were over one billion, say um, 30, I think we stopped counting. Uh, and, and I was like, there's all this incredible talent that we're not accessing because the barriers to entry to this little club are so high. And those barriers can be networks, um, they can be training, it can be, you know, sometimes like psychological, it's psychological, like social barriers as well. Like, you know, like this is not about them, it's going to be done, it's going to replace you, that kind of thing. And so, you know, looking at it from, you, know, you can look at it in two ways, right? You can look at it from a social justice component, you know, in the sense that those barriers are high and leading them there. Um, but you could also look at it from a macroeconomic uh, component. And I was uh and the ministry of the uh economy the time specifically the COVID crisis sure. right at the time it did hit the ecosystem and so in order for the French tech ecosystem to succeed you literally needed the best founders the best entrepreneurs from everywhere and there are a lot of there's a lot of really great talent we were not getting access to because of these barriers we just been shooting ourselves in the foot and so i built this program um, that essentially uh, actively sought out 200 to 250 of the best uh you know untapped founder talent uh, they were from refugee backgrounds they were from the rural areas of france they were from low-income neighborhoods um, and uh, and the idea was to mimic the kind of advantages we may have had had they not come from a wealth, had they come from a wealth to be family. So they had 45,000, sorry, 42,000 euros off the bat, a spot in an incubator accelerator, um, access to uh, a, a, network, a, a network of people that had been curated by the ecosystem and to investors as well. And so if I were to think about that and be like, well, what, how would we apply that to, to um, you know, digital heritage conservation? Um, I think I think where where we have an advantage here is that we're in the build phase. I mean that's what it sounds like, right? It sounds like we're really in the beginning. Yeah. So it feels like we have an opportunity to build, you know, like inclusive as, as part of you know, as part of the design, right? And I um, and this is like about like accessibility, it's representation, right? And, and I say this as someone who grew up in a, a something in the Philippines, you know, like a country that you know, was was colonized before it was even created, and you carry the name of the Spanish king. And, and, and something that was really painful, I think, for a lot of us growing up was that knowing that anything that had to do with our own heritage just came from archives of colonizers, and nothing was really ours. So I think there's there's a lot also to say about making sure that. You know, as we, we put things into the time capsule, so to speak, how do we make sure that it represents really a lived experience and very inclusive in this approach? And then visual accessibility as well. It's a topic that kind of drives me crazy because it's 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 one of those very brief and very painful topics that for some reason doesn't get brought up. But you know that less than 75% of the internet today is accessible to people with disabilities, right? If you, if you are dyslexic, right. if you're on the spectrum, if you yeah. have any form of visual or hearing impairment, like, you can't access most of the internet. And the problem with that is the internet is where we go for the personal and professional growth. Um, and so I think these are two things that will hopefully will, will, will be built in as you, as you think about what it is you want to build you know, consciously, right? Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. I've actually, and I noticed this, um, I wasn't conscious in thinking about it uh, because I'm not visually impaired, but there were there were some projects that have that I've seen launched uh, recently. Google Arts and Culture actually released a few where there was basically we made an audio version of a website. So we were going mm -hmm. to release like an online exhibition that was a museum exhibition about this art curated, but you know, the art is, is visual, but we really need to be thinking more about making, you know, making this accessible, not only 
making it accessible in say 40 or 50 or 80 different languages so that mm. you know your browser setting brings that up but also for the uh for, for people with uh disabilities and creating like an audio version of a of a visual experience i think is a, is, is one step to do that but that's a really yeah, well, you know, if anyone can, can do it it's definitely it's going to the but i think yeah. that you know that, that 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 just that's just my topic but i, I was wondering like what are what are some of the other ethical concerns when when recreating um, heritage in the digital sphere? I'm guessing you know inclusivity is just one of them, but there must be others that you're grappling with. Sure, sure, absolutely. So I would say I've, I've probably I've I've met this at different points in my career, but one that stands out is the one that you referenced before about um, about like that I was at a university and now. I'm at Google Arts and Culture, and I was met, mentioned in the intro about my work in Mosul, um, which I've never been to Mosul, but here's the, the example, is that we worked with people, tourists who had taken photographs um, of heritage sites and objects that were destroyed by Daesh in Iraq and in Syria. They sent us, we created a volunteer initiative, it was called Recre, but as a open source volunteer initiative online and ensuring the ethical ramifications of recreating lost heritage of heritage that is not technically mine per se but we you know under unesco's shared global uh heritage that we all share it, it works that way we had to ensure that um we got in contact with the museum curators who had not the museum hadn't been open for a very long time they helped create the descriptions, the metadata, they shared the information with us so that we, when we were able to make 3D reconstructions of heritage that has been lost to time now, because it has been destroyed physically, now we have a, a, a digital version of it, but we needed to create descriptions and making those descriptions written out in English by people who are experts in their fields and ensuring, and then we actually created 3D prints we sent them back to Mosul and they put them on display in Mosul for the first exhibition after the occupation of Daesh as a celebration. They did it also with local artists who were displaying their artwork. So I think that, and, and it's not to, to use that, you know, that example works, works well. There are also very challenging situations in doing that. But I think the important point is communication and communication with the local and international experts. So from an international level, UNESCO, and from the local level, wherever that heritage uh, calls home. So guys, we have, that was wonderful. We have two minutes left. Kat, I'd love to hear your reaction to that, to the answer on your ethical question and, and what you might be doing on your side. Yeah. And then we'll wrap I, up our first dialogue. Yeah. Thanks. I, you know, I'm sure, you know, can you talk about this topic all the time? And this is something I'm really, you know, sort of discovering. Uh, through, through this conversation and, and and there's something that's a little scary about it because it sounds like you've got a lot of power there you know it sounds like there aren't a lot of organizations that can actually engage in, in, in the quality and this in the sheer scale of, of, uh, of you know um, digital heritage like you can what what are some of the you know what do you call it? I'm trying to find a word in, in English and gather through like what are some of the things that you, you, you sort of ethical sort of limits that you set for yourselves or some fail safe that you put in to make yeah. sure that you know, you're always striving to do the right thing. So it was new, it was absolutely new terrain for us. So what we we thought, let's just reach out to the ministry. At that time I was in G Germany, we reached out to the the, um, the ministry, or sorry, the um, the embassy of Iraq. And we said, this is what, you know, this is the initiative that we started. It's getting a lot of press attention because it could only happen from press attention that people would then donate their photographs as an open source initiative. And it worked out really well. And people, we asked other archeologists to like, can we do this? And they're like, well, no one's actually tried to do this before. So if everyone is happy, if the, if the government of Iraq, if the minister of culture, if the Mosul museum curator is happy, with the way that we do it, I think it's just, as I said, it's about communicating and when you're, especially when you're going into new terrain that hasn't been, you know, established and, and how to do that. But it, other, other examples are very, very challenging from ethical backgrounds, I can understand. Okay, thank you. I have to jump in to now. <laughs> um, but really, thank you so much, Chance, Kat. That was a, a first great dialogue, a lot about what we're doing uh, to be socially conscious in the, the digital era and 
uh, concerning heritage. So it was, it was a great kickoff, very interesting. And now we are ready to start our second dialogue. And our panelists for the second dialogue are Ms. Uh, Anna Bjain and Mr. Rafik Anadol. So with Ms. Jane, she is a celebrated Indian designer and a futurist. She is the co-founder and the director of Superflux, which is an award-winning design company, which is at the intersection of climate crisis, politics, and artificial intelligence. And she is going to be discussing with Mr. Anadol, who is a globally recognized Turkish new media artist known for data-driven machine learning algorithms that create abstract environments. He's also a lecturer at UCLA's Department of Design Media Arts. So turning over to you two, let's start by giving the microphone to Anna. So we're going to have this open dialogue and exchange. You ask each other questions and uh, over to you, Anna. Thank you. Sorry. Hi, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Hi, Rafik. Nice to meet you. So good to meet you. Hello, Hello everyone. Uh, thanks, everyone who's joined. I'll start with uh, asking Rafik a question, I suppose, in the format that we're going with. So, Rafik, your work um, is very beautiful, stunning work. Um, I wanted to draw attention to the fact that, you know, you are using you've taken data and are using it as material for your art really um you, you know you've over the years created what you call data paintings and sculptures with what sounds like an intention to try and find meaning behind the idea of the data but what i find really interesting is that as such data is what we use to evidence everything in society it's the purview of the of the powerful it's the symbol of the rational mind it's used to justify everything um, we have you know data has this kind of real um kind of a real high uh, pedestal place you know and, and and but your work seems to challenge that perception of data and i wonder what you found and how have you dealt with this kind of challenge with um, turning data into something that's so ephemeral and perhaps not necessarily as important as we like to believe. So first of all, incredible question and I'm deeply honored to become part of this um, incredible group at, at UNESCO. So first of all, I think my journey with data started in 2008 and I think I coined the term data painting. And in 2016, um, during my residence at Google, Art Science Intelligence, I think I coined the AI data painting and AI data sculptures. But the context and discourse was super actually connected. To me, data is a form of memory. And this memory can take any shape. And I think preserving data, heritage is not too different. I do not believe the world is ready for data as a heritage yet. But I think that we have much more information about the physical context of life. In my journey in Humbly, I found that incredibly inspiring moments that when even data becomes an abstraction of reality, but the, let's, let's talk about, for example, the environmental data, right? Wind patterns, temperature, humidity, and rain, and, 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 and many other information we can gather from the info, in, in life in nature. I don't believe it's too different than Monet dreaming the atmosphere. But here we have data, an absolute truth, a memory of life. So from here, we can extend to many things. I also very much inspired by the idea of architecture as a canvas. Architecture as a canvas that when data and architecture connect through the lens of light, that is a whole new, I think, symbiotic relationships. It generates a new form of sculptures. By the way, I was so fortunate over the years, I was very much close to UNESCO heritage and incredible buildings. And actually we even um, try to find meaningful connection with data and the UNESCO heritage. And, and I, as, as an artist, I found very inspiring that when the physical and the virtual connects, there's a major um, inspiring moments
Rafiq, that's amazing. Do you do you have a related question also for for Anab that is also the, this kind of digital heritage yeah. related? Yeah. And and I think Anna, what is very um, inspiring to me was I hope my Wi-Fi is it says unstable. That's why I live it stuff. But what is inspiring to me also, Anna, like how can we truly transform the physical world in a way that is not a just a shiny pixels, but as a discourse and a depth that that maybe the filmmaking, of course, like designing a narrative or context, like where do you find these inspiring connections that I think we can explore, especially in the digital like a realm, right? When the verse, multiverse, metaverse, whatever verse, but we are now in the age of like verses than the physical world of just, you know, quality of life. So why do you see that, that, that connection? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, I suppose uh, a lot of our work, uh, my studio Superflux, uh, explores uh, the idea of imagining different possible features and bringing them to life. And I think, I think this kind of idea of experientially imagining possible worlds is 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 um, is is where perhaps the connection of the d- digitalization comes in. So the idea that Um, we see the future as a continuum. There is no future without the past. There is no future without our plural histories. And the way to bring up your plural histories into the future, maybe through the work, through the through digitization, but maybe through reenaction, maybe through simulation. Um, I I I am originally from India. I live in London, but um, funnily enough, my parents are are both conservation architects in India and have actually work to make uh, some sites listed in the UNESCO heritage sites. So I have grown up with a lot of uh, love for uh, the work that UNESCO do and also just spend my childhood around ruined castles and forts. And so I carry that with me, I suppose, in my work in the sense that I work in the future, but the future is built on the bones and actions of the present and the past. So whether it's through digital means or whether it's through um, any other means, the idea of heritage, the future is also as much our heritage as the past is something that I really want to hold on to. Um, And I suppose building on that idea, because um, you are working a lot with archives, you're working a lot with archival material, uh, in a way you are, I suppose, working to, 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 to preserve the, uh, our digital heritage. Would you, would you say that? Would, would, yes. would you agree with that? Yes. Actually, and it's a perfect point because it was 2016 when I was very much fortunate to work with the very first archive in Istanbul. It was called, by the way, SALT. It's an open source 1.7 million documents. And it's the very first time we were able to gather such a public data and connect with AI and create archive dreaming. I do believe it is one of the first example of using AI and public data in an immersive environment. And it was a very inspiring experiment to see, of course, speculate the library of the future. I mean, mm-hmm. I do believe, I mean, it's maybe a very childish artistic dream, but I do hope that as humanity, we need this library of the future where every single data in the world, every single open, honest, ethically correct memories of the humanity can be accessible. I don't know where this may exist. I mean, it's like a kind of an Alexandria and a kind of a new ways of maybe imagining, but it's really inspiring the last six years. We work with incredible information from different archives, cultural institutions, recently Gaudi, Casabatio, one of the UNESCO heritage, where we challenge ourselves, like what, what does it mean to like preserve, um, you know, LIDAR scanning of a cultural heritage? And how can we like preserve blockchain as a mean of like library? So we challenge many of our projects from fresh perspectives. But I do believe that if we have a chance to create this imaginary library, a library that holds every single information in the world where every, everyone can equally access or even though we don't have a space, but maybe some certain you know, pop-up libraries where AI and data allows us to interact with it. I think this can be an incredible uh, feature of the you know, imagination with physical and virtual world. So my work is deeply 
connected with the public data, public archives, uh, to, to create public art that is for anyone, any age and any background in the world. And I think many creators main challenges, I do believe, how to make inclusive and exciting, um, inspiring, educating discourse and context. Uh, and I found it in the archives. I found that archives of humanity, such as any single UNESCO information or, or building can be one of those um, very important data. And also I have this very childish dream to, to invent the language of humanity. And I do believe that that language can only be invented by the archives of humanity. And, um, and uh, from my end also, I have one more question. Um, so as we all know, like the, the world with VR, AR, XR, it's a profoundly changing uh, practicing the, the physical and the virtual worlds. Uh, and and, and do, you, do you find any extreme practical experiences where both physical and virtual experiences or sense of presence, right? One of the most challenging now topic of like, like what does, I mean, by the way, I'm, I'm a computer nerd, but I love being in the physical world as much as possible. So please don't get me wrong, but I love the physical world as much as. So how, how, do, you, how do you find the context, um, the bridge between the physical and virtual so far explored by technology? Do you see any ramifications? Do you see any, any advantages? that we are not aware or would like to be aware of it? Yeah, that's a really interesting uh, question, something we're really exploring deeply at the moment, working with cognitive scientists and neuroscientists, actually, because one of the interesting things things that happens in our work is that we are putting people inside physical simulations of alternate futures or alternate worlds. And we believe that that sort of physical embodiment of, an, of, a, of a one possible reality is really important because we are not just rational minds thinking with, with, with our brains, we are thinking through our bodies. And it is important to have that embodied experience so that uh, we are perhaps able to make more informed decisions about the future. So it's no longer a, a slide deck, but you are actually stepping inside worlds. And what has been recently found by uh, 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 some incredible um, uh, cognitive scientists is that our imagination is um, basically, we cannot imagine our future selves. When we start to imagine our future selves, we start to think of it as somebody else. And, but what we can do is we, we do remember episodic memories that is key events of our past. So if we are able to get people to pre-experience the future, then they are able to store those ideas of those experience as memories. And that's where I think there's an interesting blur between the physical and the digital. Can we create or create imaginative quote unquote, episodic memory and infiltrate the digital world with, with these alternative views and plural worlds so that they become part of people's kind of cognitive experiences. And then things that currently seem impossible, like being carbon neutral, could become a possibility because we can see that world and how different it would be. We could, we could create something more meaningful for future generations. So I think there's a lot, a big role that technology can play, but I also believe that um, we need to be empowered with the stories and the narratives that we tell each other because that's what connects us as people. Jane, Ms. Jane, could I, could I also ask just on that point, um, how does that tie in with heritage when we're having these experiences and empowering? Where does that come back around to the future of, of heritage? Do you think? I think I think for me, I would say that's a great question, Michelle. I would say heritage is a very rich term, and I think I would want to encompass the idea of heritage is not just physical buildings, but our physical planet and all our species and all the heritage on which we are built. So when we see current visions of the future, they are often these clean white slates of a, you know, like a beautiful kitchen and you touch things and food will cook and you have this very seductive yet completely unrealistic visions of the future that are deeply seductive, but perhaps not what the world will be like, which will be messy. And so I think what heritage does is that it reminds us constantly that we have been, the future is a sediment on top of a rich history of sedimentary layers, which includes 
so much richness of our heritage. And I think acknowledging our histories and acknowledging our heritage is the only way to consider making better decisions about the future. So I think there is there are no futures without histories and there are no futures without our heritage. And I think that's the connection for me. What about just the last um, couple of minutes, Rafik, uh, for you, same same kind of question. How is, yes. how is the digital and the art tying in with, with the future of the next 50 years for heritage? Yeah, I think we, we will probably need to find an incredible way of correlating, again, data. And I think data is the footprint for humanities in, a, in any scale we can use it. I was talking with Ian Hodder, there, professor from Stanford, who have been um, excavating Chatal Hoyuk. And, and we worked with his 25 years of every single findings. And it was an incredible moment that I learned that so far nobody worked with AI in such an incredible archives. And actually, I do believe there is a lot of headroom, a lot of room to truly understand these incredible archives. And we were so happy to see such a like a legendary archaeologue and anthropologue enjoying how AI in his 25 years of body of work can be restructured and become an experience. So I do believe we have a lot of headrooms for the next five decades about you. And he said that data is a trace. Data is not so different finding something in Gebekli Tepe or Chatal Hoyuk. He found exactly the same meaning in the cloud computing, in the archives of humanity. So it was very fascinating to think like this. And secondly, our recent Gaudi Casabatio project, it was an incredible experiment, how to use blockchain and new technologies that doesn't forget, that doesn't destroy, it. like a chain that is hopefully more profound. Maybe it's a very good time to, to reimagine the archiving of the future. Remembering the future will not be that, I think only by the tools we have right now, but the tools with the tech giants, the world that is inventing the future. So I heavily believe that very closely collaborating with the tech world, working with AI institutions, data institutions, and most likely creators to come up with the new ways of remembering and, live and, and archiving the future. And I do believe we have enough tools and just need more opportunities to like deep dive into these ideas. Anab, do you have um, a last minute, one minute reaction, comment, last idea? I, I, I would, uh, I think, um, imagining what would our future heritage sites be, digital and physical, is a fantastic uh, kind of thought experiment to leave everyone with. Thank you. Wow, well, that's really been a great exchange. Um, very exciting, very informative, very futuristic. Uh, thank you both very much. Um, you know, for, for those of you who are just joining us now, because um, it's, it's um, several of these discussions that we're having. So it's 50 minds for the next 50. We're talking about digital transformation. We have a lot of people listening and watching. I wanted to also mention that the director of World Heritage here at UNESCO, Lazar Alundo, is also following along. So I want to um, move on to the next dialogue with our next two thinkers for the next 50. And I would like to introduce now um, Rachel Sibande and Joanna Figueria, if I said it correctly. Um, sorry, am I, I'm jumping, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I just went to the, the wrong one. So we've got, we've got two panelists for our third debate and we are going to see um, and hear from Ms. Abir Abu Ghaid and from Mr. Vit Sisler. Mm -hmm. So Ms. Abir Abu Ghaid is one of the first Palestinian women to establish a tech startup. She is the founder and CEO of MENA Alliances Group which provides fully localized business and technology solutions while creating economic opportunities for talent in the MENA region. And we're joined with Mr. Vit Sisler. He is a Czech game designer. He's designed an award-winning video and educational game that explores World War II from the perspective of survivors. He is also an assistant professor of new media studies at Charles University, and he is a researcher and a writer. 
So we're going to have Vit and uh, Abir. They're going to have an exchange, a really dynamic dialogue. So I am going to pass the floor over to Vit, who might like to ask the first question to Abir. Thank you both. Hi, and really thanks for organizing this event and for inviting me to this fascinating conversation. My first question yeah. to Abir, which is based on your experience and work, which, which I deeply admire, is uh, how can online-based networks uh, of professionals be mobilized in favor of heritage? Yeah. First of all, thank you so much for, uh, for this opportunity, and I'm so happy to be with you. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the online um, uh, network, it will help our, it helped a lot of uh, women and young people to participate and to be engaged in the heritage. Uh, so for example, um, at MENA Alliances, we are trying to uh, translate and localize the content uh, um, for, for businesses and even for libraries, which is something that we are doing to localize and localization is different than translation. Localize, localization is something that you are doing to, uh, to, to, uh, to localize the content, localize uh, the, thing, uh, the, the thing and taking into consideration the values uh, for the community, which is very important uh, for any, um, any, any culture to be respectful for their culture and take into consideration that when you do localization. The other thing it's about also helping uh, women who's doing, for example, uh, like at um, heritage or at traditional clothes to publish their uh, to publish that online. The other thing which is uh, also um, uh, working on it's we are working with uh, with blockchain companies that use NFTs uh, to protect uh, to protect the. Uh, you know, like uh, uh, their heritage, their uh, arts, for example. And this is also something that we are doing. Um, I will give you an example also on, on how uh, also we, um, we can use, um, you know, like, or we can use online in, in that. So for example, we participate in a project with Google uh, to, uh, uh, to enhance the voice recognition of Arabic dialects which is for, for people who's um, not knowing what, how many Arabic dialects we have, uh, we have almost 16 Arabic dialects, which is, which is different. And each one should be spelled in different way, despite that we are using the same language. So this is something that we, uh, uh, that we engage, for example, women and young people uh, to use it to do like uh, to do to enhance the voice recognition and to engage uh, uh, you know to to protect the dialect of Arabic or the MENA region uh, uh, that we are doing so yeah so that's uh, so that's in general. Vet, uh, do you have any other question for me? I'm not sure if it's clear. Hello. Yep. Um... Yeah. Actually, yeah, I, I will have like a like a like kind of a follow up question to that. What you what you just uh, said. Uh, what, what what role can women and youth particularly play in favor of heritage protection and promotion uh, using the power of technology? Yeah, I think I think the the you know now especially for for people like us uh, living in conflict zone, uh, it's very important to protect uh, the the heritage and to protect the culture. And to do so, uh, I think it's, uh, it's very important to engage the community in, in, in protecting the heritage by using, for example, social media. Uh, so recently, if you, um, if you noticed, um, uh, the last year, we have uh, like a uh, Gaza war, which has, uh, which have, you know, which, which created a lot of dialogue and um, people getting engaged in in, in writing the stories on mentioning the stories so now the community that you, by using social media we are more engaged as a community in telling the stories which is something that we didn't have it in in the previous 
uh, or in the pre previous uh, years. Now also, uh, what I want to say also here that using, for example, uh, uh, new technology like NFTs, it will also help us to protect our heritage. So for example, in the, uh, you know, in, in uh, uh, since the MENA region, it's a country, it's a place where there is a lot of conflicts there. I think, um, uh, and and some of, of the audio, of the, the speaker mentioned something about Iraq, for example, and how how some of um, uh, how some of uh, in the previous uh, wars, some of uh, of people uh, shipped uh, a lot of her our heritage to British or Britain or, for example, to France to protect that. But now I think we can copy. Uh, our heritage using 3D modeling, or for example, we can do, uh, we, we can protect it like using the digital, like NFTs or uh, or other other tools. So now it's it's I think it's we can uh, we can do that by uh, engaging uh, technology, but we should enable women and youth to use this technology to protect our heritage which is very important to enable people to be like part of this heritage and to protect this heritage, which is, which is I, I believe it's important. Thank you, Abir. And I, I just want to say to everyone, we're sorry, we have one technical difficulty with the image for Abir. So it's at least for, for what I can see, it's not very oh. clear, but um, we hear you very clearly. Thank you, Abir. Maybe in reacting mm -hmm. then, um, or you have a question, Abir, to give to, to Vit because he's, kind of doing a lot of the same. Oh, there, we see you a bit better. We do see you a bit better, thank you. Um, okay. In terms I of the gaming, there you yeah. are, yeah, gaming and education. What, what would be your question for, for Vit? Yeah, this is the, thank you so much for, for that. My question is, you know that, um, um, that um, the history is about stories. And uh, usually uh, the, the, the stories um, written by the winner, especially in conflict zone. So how we ensure, for example, that we are, um, we are you know, uh, using the technology to, 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 um, to set or to telling the story that is not biased by any party, uh, especially in, in areas like conflict zone. Yeah, actually, that's, that's a great question. Um, and in fact, we are kind of dealing with, uh, uh, or in, in our in work, we are kind of dealing with uh, something related to that. Uh, just uh, what we actually, just with brief context, what we actually uh, do, we designed historical video, which uh, are based on real stories, which are based on real tips uh, of people who lived through Nazi occupation and the Second World War. And uh, what we try to really ensure, we, like, yeah, we developed the games with professional historians. Now, one of our main goals was to include the voices uh, or include um, the perspectives of those typically marginalized in, you know, like dominant public, it included not only, for example, of the you know, experiences of women, uh, of civilians and children uh, through the war, which are, you know, not typically uh, included in, especially the gaming media. Uh, uh, like when you talk about, when you talk about the ways uh, games, uh, video games typically and uh, conflict or they typically presented from a very like military tactical perspective. What is like missing is the broader context border codex suffering uh, and the civil, particularly the civil perspective, particularly the perspective of women and children. We try to do in our game, which are, which are used in, 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 in high and in like universities all over the public. So we, for example, the perspective uh, uh, not only uh, typical, uh, one great thing which can connect games storytelling as such. With, with, I would say, uh, digital storytelling can really uh, enable you to explore different perspectives. And that's really strong. If you design them, you know, with that capacity in mind, they can really enable you to see certain uh, conflicted events and perspective and, 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 and history and history from different uh, personal and intimate perspectives. 
beyond just you know the the, the historical facts if they kind of like answer the question yeah that's a, that's great thank you and my other question to you it's as a scholar of new media do you feel that there is a widening gap between uh, contemporary uh, culture and heritage? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say, uh, I wouldn't say there is a gap. Uh, so actually it seems uh, the hose has stopped my video, which I don't really can't do anything about that. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you can please switch it on. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry for that. Is it now? No. Yeah, now we, we see you now, Vit. Perfect. Um, Sorry for that. Uh, please continue. Yeah. yeah. I would say, I would say in my there's, there's not a necessarily gap uh, between uh, between um, between uh, contemporary culture and heritage, uh, but it, it's it's a, it's a it's a complex question, and I would say today the boundary between digital and non digital is disappearing, and like digital environment is a simple normal part of our life and digital environments. So I would say it's key for us to understand the affordances and limitations of these media and environment. And we can see kind of like. Uh, on one hand, we can see a lot of empowerment and a lot of lot of uh, a lot of affordances in, in, in digital media and, and contemporary digital culture, in, in global and local you know initiatives dealing with protecting heritage, enabling grassroots organization and community building, and this is really important because the challenges even any individual can handle and necessary need joint global, transnational and translocal efforts. Uh, so that's one very positive thing. Yeah, there are of course uh, quite important challenges we we face with you know let's say contemporary digital culture, and I would say particularly with our uh, for example reliance on social network guys. One is that uh, one defragmentation and increasingly those and that kind of you create mind by by for example you know, content, uh, social media, you can see like lower coach and bubbles, etc. You can see like, like increasing polarization, uh, I would say on the political level. We, I think we still don't really uh, uh, comprehend how these media, uh, what is their impact on government, mm -hmm. uh, like, Another challenge is, of course, uh, environmental. And I think this is uh, talking about digital media, digital games. Typically think of it here as something you know, different and virtual, but these media, uh, both hard production and, 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 and you know, their usage, environmental impact. Uh, uh, and especially in countries where, you know, uh, where, where uh, the, the minerals are mined or where these, where these, uh, where these uh, technologies are produced, but also just using, using it. And um, that's, I think, something uh, which can have profound impact on our future. And I think we are still kind of dealing with these two tendencies and we are still like kind of assessing the real ways how to help how, how the you know, negative uh, natural and heritage. I think I'll follow up like this, uh, which is kind of uh, linked to that. Uh, my next question to you would be kind of, what is the relationship between heritage, communal culture values and, and digital technology? Yeah, so it's easy to answer the, the, the question uh, about the heritage and technology, but I think the value it's, it's here the most important thing because it's, it's something you can touch, okay? So the values is different between the cultures and of the different culture and different heritage. And we need to ensure that one, when we do uh, digitization for our heritage and transform that, we, we don't want to forget about the values, how we will uh, um, you know, transfer or uh, transfer uh, the values with, with the heritage, which is important. No, so I believe that um, 
having the protocols um, uh, uh, to, 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 protect, uh, to protect this, uh, for example, the heritage, the, the values that we have, uh, and that's that protocol that uh, should be like respectful for different culture, um, it's important thing. And I believe that UNESCO or uh, the UN organization can help help with setting this protocol, but we need to ensure that uh, we are respectful for different culture, even if we are, for example, not agreeing with some of of that. So I will give you an example. So for example, as a, as a woman in Arab countries, we are, uh, one of our values is um, it's, it's having families. Okay, or, and we dedicate all, a lot of time for our families and having this strong relationship. Now, when we have the digitization and working on, with, with COVID, for example, um, and with things like that, a lot of work become remotely, okay? And that's uh, that means that you need, for example, uh, to to, um, to to have this kind of uh, of work uh, or uh, this kind of engagement between work and uh, the the and in, in, in inside your home, which means that you enter uh, the the outside world in 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 your homes. Okay, which is have for us as a culture, it's, we have a privacy. You know, so this is something that we which. I, so for example, uh, when we have a meeting, usually we don't show uh, our video or we don't, for example, open our camera uh, sometimes because it's from our home and we should, for example, wear our hijab when we do that and something like that. So which is something that other cultures, they don't understand it. Um, so they they usually, I, I heard some of my friends say, oh, why you don't, for example, open your camera on and do that. But this is our culture, and um, and we should we should also we should not forget that we should be respectful for different culture, even if if we, if, if it doesn't make sense to others. Now, uh, the as I mentioned, the values it's important to be transformed with the heritage. So, and we need to reflect that while we are we are using technology, and we want to be ensure that there is no bias. Uh, uh, um, when we also, when we, when we uh, use technology and when we use um, heritage and values toward that. So this is some, th this is, this is a, like a relationship between all of them. And we want to ensure that we are transforming those values in the right way. I'm not sure. Thank if, you. If it, yeah, my that point was great. Is, well, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Abir. Just we have a minute left there, and I'm I'm just wondering, Vitz, uh, same kind of question. Where do you see the value coming in as a uh, intersecting with uh, the digital and the heritage? What would what would be your position on that for one minute? Yeah, uh, I think it's uh, what I, I like to agree with Abir, and um, there is a. Uh, Again, from my perspective, which is, uh, like you know, I'm a des designer of serial games uh, uh, and particular games which tell story. I think there is a bit uh, like like storytelling is a uh, really important uh, human need and nature, and something which like telling telling stories and sharing stories is something something which make, makes us human. I would say, and values like are sometimes committed through stories through narrative. And games actually be in uh, kind of vehicle for encounter with cultures, for encounter with uh, other places and other history, and from like learning different perspectives. And for example, it's also one thing we did. Uh, we actually designed an editor uh, in which in which other students and you know people from other countries and other, other cultures can design their own kind. Of of game family histories and, and personal histories and I, I believe that um uh digital media be great place of encounter with the other or it's something different from us and with like understanding and and learning and respecting other cultures and values it's kind of connected 
Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you very much for, for this interesting and very interdisciplinary from, from two different uh, sections of what's going on digitally with heritage. Uh, so many thanks to you, Vit Siesler, and also to you, Abir Abulgait. Uh, so now we're going to move on to now our fourth dialogue with two new thinkers. And I'm really happy to welcome now Rachel Sibande and Joanna Figuira. So Dr. Rachel Sibande, she is a digital and data development specialist and a social entrepreneur from Malawi. She is the founder of MHub, Malawi's first technology hub and incubator for emerging entrepreneurs. And she's going to be discussing with Joanna Figuria who is a Venezuelan entrepreneur. And she is one of the co-founders of Code for Venezuela, an organization that aspires to transform Venezuela using technology and innovation through the power of crowdsourcing and resource sharing. So let's jump straight in. I'm going to invite Joanna to uh, take the mic and to pose the first question to Rachel, please. Go ahead, ladies, thanks. Awesome. Um, hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. I'll be speaking in Spanish. So I invite everyone to use the interpretation feature here in the Zoom, which works very well. Um, so it's a great pleasure to meet you, Rachel. I have uh, read up uh, on you, on what you do, on your work in the uh, incubator that you have uh, set up and created. And uh, I'd really like to ask you, since you work with uh, young people who uh, are really very digital savvy, and I'd like to ask you what potential you think these young people have to protect heritage in their communities in Malawi. Thank you, Joanna. So yes, I'm originally from Malawi, um, and Malawi is, and just to set context, over our youth, youth under 30, and I established is actually the young people. And so there are a number of things that we do as a technology hub. We champion the development of technology solutions. We train young people to earn digital skills like you do, Johanna. These are skills from basic ICD skills, development of web applications, mobile apps, robotics, machine learning, big data, internet of things, you name it. But we also train these young people how to map um, their communities. And within that, they are also mapping heritage sites or cultural um, landmarks using OpenStreetMap and Google. But to your question, um, where what is the potential that we see in digitally empowered youths to protect heritage in their communities? We see a lot of potential with young people um, in a number of ways. First, youths are the greatest mappers of these heritage sites. And as you know, it's very important to map um, these heritage sites to get more people to them. Secondly, we find that youths are great consumers of digital content um, around cultural heritage, which is very important uh, in ensuring that they also absorb um, heritage content. We also find that youths are great creators of content uh, to complement what's already there in these heritage sites. They are generally digital citizens. Um, we see that youths are tech enthusiasts. They are the most eminent digital citizens of this generation. And so they do have a role to create innovative technology solutions. It could be 3D documentation or use of drain technology to map um, some of these heritage sites or blockchain for information sharing or artificial intelligence, or indeed, virtual reality to help their communities and the world to experience heritage within their communities. So this is the potential we see in young people. And that is why we invest in training most of these young people to become consumers, but also creators of technology solutions. Thank you, Johanna. Gracias. Gracias por esa. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. Rachel, do you have a similar question for Joanna? Yes. Um, so in Kosovo, Joanna, what is the role of the Ministry of Culture and Heritage in the Ministry of Culture and Heritage? I wanted to understand from your perspective in the work that you do, how do you see the digital divide affecting access to heritage? Es, es una muy buena pregunta. Y... Well, that is a very good question. And I really would like to take the optimistic approach here. We know that accessing some high level technologies uh, is not always possible for everyone. But when technology moves forward, when it becomes more popular, then costs go down, it becomes more accessible for a greater number of people. And uh, people can all access a certain amount of technology when it becomes more popular. I mean, if you think about the internet, 30 years ago uh, when it started, if you compare that to today where over half the planet has a cell phone, which is practically a computer in your pocket. Now, that is something that we had simply not imagined, I think, 30 years ago. Nobody could imagine this would happen. So there is much left to be done. We still have communities that don't have any access whatsoever, but we have those figures today. Over half the global population has a cell phone. To me, that's completely incredible. So as things move forward, communities gain greater access to what we call the digital world. And it's not only a matter of having uh, education and knowledge, it's using technology to tell their own stories and to protect their own cultural heritage. To give just one example of how this can take place, in Venezuela we had the opportunity of working with an, op uh, an organization in the country that, that is in contact with very remote localities, localities uh, that are practically inaccessible within the country or that nobody knows about. And they are using the digital approach to give a digital um, uh, knowledge uh, to uh, transmit music, uh, stories and places that are unknown within the country itself and as well, which is not such a large country. And now they're much better known. I think this is wonderful access, uh, thanks to digital technology to preserve cultural heritage and, and getting these cultures to be better known. And I, I think that we can perhaps dream about the possibility of virtual reality or extended uh, reality to play their role in the coming 50 years, where we will have more immersive realities to have this human experience, thanks to these technologies that, yes, uh, are very limited today, but maybe it will be like cell phones, and the day will come when there is much more access to this. So I'm a lot more optimistic about the digital divide and access to uh, cultural heritage, thanks to it. Thank you. And thank you for the question. I think that uh, it's my turn for, for, to have a question for you. So what we're also discussing today is the variety of tools that are uh, available to cultural heritage today and to world her heritage. And my question to you is, what are the easy tools, the most accessible tools for the public that could be set up, that could be created to uh, safeguard or protect cultural heritage? Thank you, Johanna. So, I mean, I will pick it up from where you left off. Um, you were talking about mobile phones. Um, and indeed, mobile phones are the most pervasive ICT tool that there is and that there will ever be. When we talk about bridging the digital divide, the convergence of digital will only happen on the mobile. And therefore, to your question, where should we be deploying digital tools that can create or raise awareness about heritage? I think our first stop point should certainly be the mobile phone because this is the place where over half and more of the global population are. And majority of people, even in least developing countries, um, women 
will at least have access to a mobile phone that then, than they can with any other um, gadget. Aside of that, it's also important for us to consider platforms like social media, where we've seen a lot of um, uh, the populace uh, existing. Um, Audiovisual content is certainly a big seller because it appeals. Uh, people can relate to audio, people can relate to visual content. Uh, we have to find the people where they are in manners that it's easy for them to access because the cost of certain devices, certain gadgets, certain platforms, and the skills that are required to get people on certain digital platforms are not easily attainable. But the mobile becomes a very easy platform for which for us to, to find um, people. I just wanted to finish by saying, as we do that, it's important for us to consider the visually impaired and the deaf. It is also important for us to consider the disparities that exist in terms of access and use of mobile platforms um, by gender. In most countries, we find that fewer women than men have access to these platforms. So it's just important to also make those considerations as we build these digital platforms to raise awareness about digital heritage. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Do you have another question for me? Um, otherwise, I, I do have further questions for you as well. No, I wanted to follow up and ask you another um, question, Johanna, just picking up from um, where we left off with you earlier. So do you think that um, cultural and natural heritage can be a source of communal resilience, uh, particularly among marginalized or disadvantaged communities? And if so, how do you think digital technology can actually enhance this resilience? Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Now, I think that this follows up on what we were discussing a moment ago and the example that I gave about uh, the, the Virongo people in Venezuela who, thanks to technology, uh, were able to uh, overcome the crisis uh, in Venezuela, basically. And this is thanks to culture. Uh, they were able to uh, get it better known, to get their culture better known thanks to technology. So this may seem to be a commercial approach, but if you look at the cultural benefits of preserving your traditions, I think it's a wonderful result. Uh, another example that I have in mind, uh, also about how communities that are marginalized make use of technology uh, has to do with social media. We have a number of examples of uh, um, ambassadors, persons, and I've seen especially in Canada and the United States, who've used social media to get their uh, communities and their cultures better known, the first or second generations that are sharing their ancestral knowledge. And they've become the ambassadors of their peoples. They have millions of followers. And they would never have found out about these cultures otherwise. And I think that's wonderful. I, I think that people uh, who um, are making use of social media, adapting to their audience, and the audience uh, are acquiring uh, cultural wealth. And that is uh, also a form of resilience uh, on the digital uh, world, in the digital world. And I, I can also tell my own stories. In, a, in another uh, situation, it would not have been possible. How do you get these uh, uh, local communities in Canada, a very small group of people who get their culture known, their stories known? They didn't used to have the tools uh, previously to, to get anything 
published and known to the public. So it is a form of resistance. It is a form of resilience. It is a way of saying, here we are. And uh, we are going to tell you about our places, our traditions, uh, uh, in a way that is respectful and attractive to new generations. So that's the way I understand it, the way technology can help these communities to get their stories known. And to follow up, you were talking about something that's really very important about women and access to technology. Now, we all know that women have a very important role to play uh, in terms of being the bearers of traditions in their communities. Oh, when we talk about uh, heritage, cultural heritage, women do have a major role to play. Do you think that a digital transformation poses a threat to the crucial role played by women, or can they use it to their advantage? Thanks, Johanna. Um, that's a very relevant question, yes, as a segue to where I had left off last time. Certainly, yes, um, because like I said, I mean, there is no doubt that uh, women are custodians of culture. Women are custodians of our heritage. In fact, to give you an example, most of the artistic impressions on one of the World Heritage sites in my country, which is called Chongoni, um, Art, Chongoni Rock, um, the arts there represent mostly women's artistic impressions. Women are storytellers. I believe that there are many examples that we can give around how women are custodians of heritage and culture. Now, the nuance though, is that there are fewer women on digital platforms. As I mentioned, fewer women access, you know, mobile phones, fewer women have, you know, tangible digital skills to get them online, to get them onto digital platforms to navigate. And so as we transition cultural heritage sites and content to digital, we need to consider other collective and collaborative interventions uh, with other sectors to drive access and use of digital skills for all, inclusive of women. We need to put in mechanisms that advance innovative ways to reduce the cost of devices, uh, cost of data, but also enhance offerings of digital skills training that are inclusive and conducive of women. There are also several cultural and social norms that deter women from earning full access, control and use of digital platforms. Those narratives have to be dismantled within our communities and social setups. Um, I want to end off by saying that we cannot talk about meaningful development or indeed um, transformation around the consuming of uh, knowledge and awareness of uh, heritage sites if we're not considering over half of the world's population who are women. Now, Johanna, I want to, to wrap up um, our session with a question to you, uh, because I do know that you have used the power of crowdsourcing before to save lives, which is very phenomenal. Well done to you. And I wanted to know, do you see a potential to leverage you know, hashtags and crowdsourcing to save heritage that is in danger, because we have learned that there are a number of heritage sites that are actually in danger. Muy buena pregunta. That's an excellent question. And I do have an example that I think can illustrate the power of social media in these cases. Now, it is a sensitive issue. I have the feeling that societies have not really fine-tuned the best way to maximize the potential of social media to unite to face a negative event. And that is a very important point. But let me give you an example of something that happened in Venezuela where, unfortunately, uh, there was a danger through lack of respect for a, a site that was a World Heritage site. Uh, the Kneim, uh, uh, Park and uh, something very unfortunate happened and the social media was the meeting point for all those citizens in Venezuela to express disapproval for this event. This led to um, consequences that I think would never have happened otherwise. I think it raised awareness 
for all those persons who were visiting the site and uh, the citizens at large as to the value of the site. This took place over three days. The social media were, um, how to put it, uh, full of viral uh, messages and hashtags as to the event. But if you look at the positive side of this example, this was used as a tool to defend heritage. And I think that this is an, an example of how social media can be used uh, in, in a, a rational framework and for the common good as a positive to protect and save uh, World Heritage Sites. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Excellent example. and the future of heritage protection and, and crowdsourcing. Um, so thank you very much, Joanna from Venezuela and Rachel from Malawi. And now we are continuing with this 50 minds for the next 50. We're having a very free exchange where people are going to build on one another's responses and ask questions directly. So our next two panelists are Max Tegmart and Tino Segal. So, Max Tegmart is a Swedish-American cosmologist, physicist, and a professor at MIT. Among his over 200 publications, he has a bestseller called Life 3.0, Being Human in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. He is also the president of the Future of Life Institute, which is dedicated to maximizing the benefits of technology and reducing its associated risks and he's going to be exchanging freely with Mr. Tino Segal. He is a German artist recognized as one of the most important artists in his generation. Tino is celebrated for his radical artistic practice that takes the form of constructed situations, live encounters between visitors and those enacting the work. He is the winner of the 55th Venice Biennale's Golden Lion Prize, also from 2013. So I would like to kick off by asking if um, we could turn over now to Tino and Max. So maybe, um, Tino, would you like to ask your first question to Max, please? Thanks, and welcome to you both. Yes. Thank you. Hi, Max. Nice to meet you. Hello, everybody. Thanks for, for the invitation. And um, I'm sorry. I have an old computer apparently or too much sun in Berlin. So I was just trying to, while you were giving the introduction, to get the sun a little bit um, dimmed. <laughs> was half successful, <laughs> but I hope you can see me. Um, yeah, so Max, yeah, this is, a, this is a fun format that we can just talk to each other. And um, I mean, I think that I'm here as a, as a, not a specialist for the digital, rather, a specialist for the embodied, the non-digital. So, Man, I feel like that you have an interesting range, you know, like <laughs> from cosmology, biophysics to machine machine learning, no, like and um, and so. Wait, hold hold on a sec. Wait, hold on a sec. The sun actually has a very nice artistic effect making you seem sort of eph ephemeral, uh, like one of your signature art styles. Yeah, sorry, like there's other species entering the room, lots of dogs, so sorry for the, for the uh, distraction. But <clears throat> thanks, Max, for helping me out. Um, so it's just, you know, like being, let's say, the non-digital specialist and you being like a cosmologist and a physicist too. And, I'm, and I listened to, you know, your TED talk, which I, which I found fascinating for different reasons about this, what you call AGI, like artificial general intelligence. So as I understand it, an intelligence, which is, you know, a machine intelligence, which supersedes human intelligence. And, and um, I was just wondering, okay, like to get right into it, you know, where does the soul, like how do you conceive as somebody who's dealing with cosmology, but also dealing with machine intelligence, how do you factor in the concept of the soul? You know, because I mean, I can explain my question, but I'm curious to hear what, how you would, because that seems to me, like maybe I can add one thing, that seems to me something very difficult 
for machines to attain. Like intelligence, yes, but what about a soul? And maybe also about vibe, you know, like then I was thinking about a vibe, you know, like there's an energetic connection between humans or humans and, and dogs, like the ones that just entered here into my office. Um, and um, so- Yeah, yeah. So I think that there are, you're asking some really interesting questions. There are many questions we can ask about machines that we don't know the answer to, like are machines actually conscious? You know, if a self-driving car drives down the street, does it experience colors or sounds or emotions, or does it even feel like anything to be the car? Uh, do machines have souls, uh, or do humans, for that matter, have souls? Uh, people can argue about that too. And regardless of uh, of the answer to these hard questions, though, regardless of whether their machines are conscious or not, or have souls or not, what what I think we can say with great confidence is that they are able to have ever more impact on the world and give ever more power to those who own them and control them. So in terms of the UNESCO uh, challenge of preserving heritage, you know, the overarching impact of ever more advanced artificial intelligence, which is what my research is focused on here at MIT, mm -hmm. will be an ever stronger concentration of power on the planet where ever fewer will have ever more power over ever more, unless we manage to radically transform our society somehow. And I'm very interested in, in, in what the ultimate heritage will be that will come out of this. You, know, you could imagine on one hand, if there's some sort of benevolence behind all this and, and, and it's guided by human values that it could help maybe life flourish for billions of years here on earth and far beyond that out in the cosmos. And we, that could be our heritage that we, spawn life in our cosmos but it could very easily also just instead lead to a nine, straight to 1984 and some, some, some sort of horrendous the, the dystopian scenario and it could also frankly lead to all of life going extinct you know within the next uh, decades because you know as as uh, lord acton famously said a power corrupts an absolute power corrupts absolutely mm. So this no, is this, I think so that, that I there's a lot of mm -hmm. mm, now there's a lot there's a lot of um, things I agree with like in your general approach and I think that maybe we can start with the the deepest things and then go more to the more um, you know like to start with the soul I guess is like the deepest level we can we can kind of come across maybe the origin of the universe or something like that is similar um, but. My, my concern is a little bit like um, when I, for example, looked at this um, chart that you have, uh, let me explain your chart. You can tell me if I do it right. Like you say, like basically art, um, artificial general intelligence, right? Like it, it's, you, you do this diagram with like mountains and the beach and sea and, and the ocean. And so the tides, tide of artificial intelligence rising. And let's say you put art, which is now my, specialization let's say you put that at the highest um point of the mountain you know and so let's say as as a specialist of art i would say i find it very difficult um to imagine like that 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 artificial general intelligence could reach such a point and um and that has something to do with maybe that at a certain point, like let's say empathy or vibrational connection plays part in intelligence. So maybe I'm not up to date in that sense that like, um, you know, I don't yeah. know what the research is about consciousness or something like that. But, and, and I, I just wonder if, if let's say the, the basis from what, what you're starting in a way that like, and this is just my curiosity. Like I know that you have a lot of curiosity about how, how the world works, let's say. And, and I have a lot of curiosity in a similar way about like, I find your, your warning extremely, and then we'll get to that later. I find your warning about artificial intelligence extremely um, important for, for many different reasons, actually, not only for one, you know? And, um, but, but I wonder if it's really, if it's really possible for a machine to make, let's say an artwork, which is relevant to the history of art. You know, that's a very difficult thing, which I, in my opinion, maybe, you know, like if you look at a century 
like we don't have art history since so long, but if you look at how many artists are really remembered from a century in terms of like, as we're here at UNESCO, like it's a handful, you know, there's not many which are remembered yeah, um, um, really on a, on a daily basis, you know, like, of course, there's many were in a, in a book or something, but to make a contribution which really remains over time seems to be an, a, more like the exception of, I find it hard to imagine that like machines could be so conscious that they could produce such a contribution. Yeah, good questions. I, th I think it's pretty clear that machines probably don't need to be conscious at all to, to create things we find interesting. This, what you're looking at here, you can debate about whether it's artistic or not, or whether it's beautiful or not, but this was created by, a, by an artificial intelligence uh, this spring. And mm -hmm. it was just asked to show a pit, make a nice pic, make a picture of an astronaut riding a horse. Mm -hmm. And this is not copied from anywhere else. The AI actually created this figure from scratch. And mm -hmm. you can see some thought went into it because it put the astronaut on the horse. It mm -hmm. put it on a space background. The, the same system when instead asked to make an armchair in the shape of an avocado, I, I think it was kind of creative. Um, especially that yeah, third like one. Art here. is something else than art is something like the way I understand. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah of course. I, totally I'm not, naive, I, and I'm still in. Let this me time. clarify. I'm not mm. claiming that this is great art or anything like this. I'm just saying that we have to be very humble. I think when we say that, it, and not before assuming that there are things that um, AI will um, not be able to do anytime soon, because. Most of these sort of predictions that were made 10 years ago have already been uh, proven wrong right now. So to me, the more interesting question is, uh, you know, what do we want uh, our, our future to be like? And do we, uh, do we want to continue racing ahead here where people are spending ever more money just trying to replace as many human jobs as possible with machines with, with, with no seeming goal in mind other than making profit from it? Or, or should we aspire to something more maybe more noble. And I wanted to ask you, because I, I love the work you've done and uh, this, this, this um, approach of create, creating ephemeral uh, art installations. I'm very interested in what can we do to make sure that humanity's heritage itself doesn't become ephemeral, you know, so that humanity's brief of time on stage here doesn't become like one of your art installations that we after 13.8 billion years of cosmic history, we wake up, we start creating art and, and so on. And then we build this technology and then in a blink of cosmic history, we're all gone because we did something thoughtless. I'm very interested in-, in um, I mean, first of all, my- How you my think work, we can- I mean, I think that, that my works are very like in a, in a way similar to Plato, you know, like Plato's idea, like, ideas were the most um, robust things, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, and this idea that, that things are very robust is a 19th century idea, you know? And, and I think that my work, as long as people are interested in, in it, and also things remain through its effect, you know? If I influence younger practitioners, that's also right. a way of remaining, you know? And um, now, if, if the human race it then, then goes, extinct at some point which there could be different reasons for you know like mm -hmm. um, but probably think, artificial I, intelligence I think, I think is the reason to be yeah, the reason or, or other reasons but i i think i i believe that our souls are here to learn so that since it wasn't in vain we came here we learned something we mm -hmm. went into other dimensions you know like which mm -hmm. you, you know probably more about than me about other other dimensions but the reason why i ask you about the soul or empathy is that like let's say my contribution here can be, and I think the reason why I was invited is that like there is of course a certain kind of, let's say, let, let me put it in a little bit provocational and vulgar terms, like youthful uh -huh. and somewhat masculine excitement about technology, you know? And in general, in our societies, like we're society, if you look at our cultures, our era here, um, which we start lar largely also started largely in Europe. So, so we're culpable, but, but a lot of people want to participate in this, let's say, technological age, uh -huh. you know, we're, we're fascinated with, with what we can do, but does it, does technology really help in, in the good life? You know, it helps in practical things. It mm. helps in making life somewhat easier, but, you know, like, it hasn't diminished work hours until it, 
now also you know like Correct. it's and and um and this question of, of of machines obliterating this is a longer conversation which you and me should have because you know i trained as an economist you know that machines take away unemployment is a is a whole field of uh, science basically economic science and and we've been dealing with that problem for you know many many decades now and yeah. we've so far, we've more or less, more or less managed to, to, to handle it. I just wonder, like, and I think that can be my role, is like, how much excitement, how much promise, how much how hope do we put into, into technology in general? That's, I think, the basis of my work. And say, like, yeah. isn't, at, at the end of the day, like, the starting point of my work is, like, you know, artists have always worked with techniques and technologies, you know, be it painting on a cave, be it a video art, piece you know or be it the internet data piece you know and, and my my thing was always to say like i'm 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 ambitious as an artist i want to work with the most complex technology on this planet in my opinion that's still the human being you know and so i make works employing and making you know making human beings act in a gallery you know like or enact um let's say my algorithms if you so wish you know and and I felt that like the the responses, you know, were quite strong. That at the end, when somebody tells you a very personal story about their life, and it's the person itself telling you that story in a gallery, you know, there's a vibrational connection between them, you know, which is com more complex than watching a screen in some way or another. Now that's that's let's say my personal take. That's also something yeah. which maybe through through my biased lens, I've gotten as a feedback, you know? And um, so I just wonder, like, I think that, that like, yeah. like what we heard Can earlier I just about- Can I comment on this? Because I yeah, think you're yeah. raising some very good points. I, I love the humility there that you exude when you say that um, we see many people just take for granted that more technology is always better. And I, I think, um, I think this is a, <laughs> This has um, become a major disease in our Western society, where we just take as a fundamental axiom that you know more technology is always better. That's even an axiom if it of messes modernity. up our climate. Yeah, even exactly, even if it ruins our climate it, 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 and creates massive inequalities and creates nuclear it, war or whatever. It, it, yeah. And, yeah, and and I think I think if we go back and look at art and and literature, we we, we get reminded that technology is not morally good or more or for that matter evil either it's a tool and it's our human responsibility to, to make sure, to think about how we're going to use this if we're going to use it for good or for bad and, and yeah but that's also to, a big big debate max i'd love to talk to you more but for example what you just said you know in German gentlemen, philosophy... gentlemen we have we have one minute left i apologize for interrupting because it's really interesting but maybe we we get a last 30 second I mean, Point I think that like, from, we should from each of you, from Max and from Tino. Without the UNESCO, but what you just said is a basic thing of German philosophy of the 20th century, that, that technology is a thought style. It's not a tool. There's a nice book called The Question mm -hmm. of Technology, which literally has that sentence. And so I think that's a tradition that, that I'm closer to and to explore, let's say, what are like the technologies of self and that like all that has been discussed mm -hmm. today about heritage, about 3D modeling, about inclusiveness of technology, I agree with all of that. But I think that like we shouldn't get overexcited. Excitement is good. Overexcitement is not good. At the end yeah. of the day, like we're humans and we we are vibrational, soulful beings, and it's important not to forget that. And that like machine learning has not attained that level. Yeah. Max, what is yeah, your so last if uh, point? Give me I can some also yeah, then go ahead. try to end on a pot, some closure here. I think we think we can agree that uh, yeah, there is a lot to be excited about with technology. We everything, every way basically in which today is better than the Stone Age is because of technology. But we should not just be excited; we should also be terrified at the same time and make sure that we steer this ever more powerful technology towards good uses and are good stewards of it. Otherwise, we'll be living in 1984 very soon or we or something even worse and uh, i would like to just end by saying though that if if we can get this right if we can, then there is an incredible heritage both to create and to preserve because what we've le also learned through science is that we had completely underestimated our human potential we used to run around trying to not get stepped on 
by bigger animals or, or starving to death. And now we realize that we are really the captains of our own destiny. If we do the right things with our technology, we can create a fantastic future, living healthy lives on earth for billions of years and beyond maybe even in the cosmos. So, so there, there's a huge, I'm, I'm hoping that we can work together to both create a fantastic heritage and then celebrate it in the UNESCO spirit. Thank you. Excellent. So we end on a positive <laughs> note for uh, technology and heritage, which I appreciate. Let's let's hope it goes that way and not towards 1984. Thank you it's both very much. Thank you, Mr. Tegmark. Thank you, Mr. Segal. Very interesting. And now we are on our sixth and our last dialogue for our 50 minds. So our last two minds, our thinkers for this last dialogue are Jean-Michel Jarre and Ethel Kofi. So Mr. Jarre is a highly celebrated French musician, a composer, performer, and producer. He's also known as the godfather of electronic music. And for his contribution in merging music and new technology, he was honored with the Stephen Hawking Medal for Science Communication. And he will be exchanging with Miss Ethel Kofi. She's an entrepreneur. Ethel is CEO and founder of Edel Technology Consulting. She's a leading figure influencing IT and empowering women in Africa. She's also sitting on the advisory board for Ghana's vice president, and she's helping design a digital strategy for Ghana. So I would like to jump in and, and start this uh, debate by handing Ethel the mic, and she's going to pose her first question to Jean-Michel. Go ahead, Ethel, thank you. Sure. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's rare that I'm in this kind of conversation, so um, I appreciate it. And then thank you, uh, John Michel, for being part of this. Um, I I was really excited when I was uh, paired with you because I recognized that I have been the presence of music royalty. Um, I have, so I'm gonna start with a few questions and then we can you know, do the back and forth. So my first question to you. So you've been uh, recently partnered with the French Metaverse platform entirely dedicated to cultural content. Now, can the Metaverse serve to protect and promote tangible heritage, do you think? Jean-Michel, I think- Jean-Michel, you you're, Jean -Michel, you're muted. Merci. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes. Uh, so thank you, Ethel, and, and good afternoon. I, it's a really a, a, my pleasure to have this conversation with you. I mean, to uh, answer to your question, actually, uh, uh, I've been quite involved the past uh, few years uh, with uh, uh, the idea of metaverse and and uh, and virtual reality, and I do think that it has uh, it has a lots of um, uh, a lot to do with. Uh, considering the preservation of uh, worldwide heritage in the future uh, for different reasons, because uh, metaverse and, and VR is a, is a way to uh, uh, connect people uh, in, in a different way, to give access to uh, uh, people who are um, isolated for social, geographic, or even handicap reasons, to suddenly uh, be in connection with some uh, uh, worldwide patrimony or some some places in in the world some areas where uh, it would be uh, otherwise impossible for them to get access to uh, to leave the experience and and the emotion and uh, so that that is where uh, technology can uh, can bring uh, can bring a, a plus I would say and to uh, just uh, uh, go back to what Max and uh, and you know where we're, we're exchanging just before I think that uh, Technology is is uh, is in a sense neutral, uh, and it's all depending on what we are what we are doing with it. And but I I, I see that uh, I consider that any technological progress should be should be accompanied with uh, uh, an, a kind of regulations in terms of ethic to have an ethic regulation. It's where and it is where UNESCO is absolutely uh, uh, essential. I mean to. Uh, at the dawn of uh, the de development of AI and uh, metaverse, I mean to to think about the regulation in a in a not in in a, in a kind of uh, not as a constraint but as 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 a freedom. What what makes the difference between uh, 
de de uh, democracy and chaos is a regulation specifically to have a set of rules. And the more the technology is uh, developed and sophisticated, more uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, a real thought about the ethic and the moral aspect of how uh, the use of technology is, uh, is important. And uh, now I, I really would like uh, Ethel to, to, to ask you also a, a few questions. And my first question would be, in your opinion, how can digital platforms help the diaspora communities to stay connected and, uh, to stay connected to and, and, and participate in their uh, heritage? What's your opinion about this? Sure. Um, I'll pick you back a little bit of your question and then and use that to answer uh, my. So I think one of the big things for, um, I suppose, Western versus uh, developing world and one where we're rethinking and reimagining heritage is sort of cutting edge, bleeding edge versus um, appropriate technology for the space that we're in. Now, one of the big things for, for people in the diaspora is, of course, they have a little bit more access than, say, the typical person on the continent. And so there are many ways, I think, in just with heritage, we, we, it's about data curation, it's about film and video, it's about collecting all that data and presenting it ways that one is accessible by the people that are on the continent, but it's also accessible and um, people that are not on the continent can interact with. One of the big things I, so I lived in London for, for a long time. One of the big things was for second generation immigrants that were born on the continent, uh, on, you know, outside the African continent was about sort of language, um, about learning their stories, about learning about their, their, their heritages and privileges. And um, the, the things were, different things have been set up. I don't think there are uh, a, lot, a lot of things there, but there are a lot of sort of um, now in terms of visual 3D modeling, um, also in terms of just, ways of teaching culture uh, where people have now set up sort of conversations and, and for people to be able to learn about their culture and, and exchange and exchange so that people in the diaspora first generation second generation third generation immigrants can begin to understand from where they come from and what their story is um yes. let me sure I, I just would like to react just very quickly on what you said because don't don't you think that Actually, what is today more important than any time, any other time, to think about when we are talking about new technology and about the future of a Web 3.0 and Internet 3.0, to think about diversity. Where, I mean, metaverse means actually, uh, uh, and the, the first, the, the original definition of metaverse is actually a, a, a diversity and multiplicity of universe, digital universe interconnected to the internet is the reverse of uh, hyper hyper centralization what right. people like meta or zuckerberg are, are trying to to control and then it means that we should really think and and invest and politically invest uh, into the uh, kind of uh, uh, thinking about being part of a sovereignty of a digital sovereignty not letting the sovereignty only to the us and to asia and, and this is uh, something very, in my opinion, very, very important, just to try to keep the balance and to balance in terms of uh, how we, we want to, to, uh, uh, to export our ideas, our identities, our uh, creations. I think this is a, a very, very uh, crucial point. If we don't want actually to, to, be, a, uh, to be really like a, the new digital uh, colonized kind of uh, communities. No, I, I totally agree with you. So if you look at the African continent, for instance, you know, it's, it's a, a mobile first continent. And of so course. any design needs to put that in, in contemplation. And then you need to think about access and affordability. Yeah. So access means how far, how, how, um, how much internet is available and how fast that internet is. Um, there are a number of global companies right now that actually hand their developers um, yeah. slow phones um, non-smartphones to help understand them to understand the, the sort of the, the, the billions of people that do not have access to extremely fast, um, you know, extremely expensive smartphones. Um, and so that when they are building solutions, they have to, so that they have to think through 
how do you ensure that I'm building a solution that ensures that uh, someone that's sitting in uh, Cameroon or Ghana or Northern Nigeria can still be able to enjoy access to it. Now affordability is a big thing. So um, if, we, if we're beginning to digitize our heritage and uh, people cannot, the affordability index, I think it's the, the hope is for one gigabyte of broadband to not be more than 1% of the average income in any country. Now yeah. that a lot of countries do not hit that in, in sort of the absolutely. Story. So absolutely. in design and in rethinking about heritage, there has to be a conversation about ensuring that we are thinking about the people that do not have the kind of access that is had in the in the Western world. Now I have a follow up question for you. Um, you you you've done sort of a lot of leading edge work around sort of musical performances. Do you bring any of that learning into what are the learnings you think we can bring into heritage from what you've done with sort of cutting edge um, with the music? I would say that, uh, I mean, uh, of, co of course, a lot of, uh, we are trapped by time, unfortunately, but I, I would like to, uh, to answer you to, uh, uh, on, on, on a different level by saying that what I learned by that is actually, we have the, the, uh, the, the th there is a threat that technology would have a, a negative influence on, on environment and then on our heritage, the heritage of our heritage regarding the planet. Mm -hmm. And I think that we cannot, we cannot conceive to uh, survive in the 20th century, the 21st century, if we are not able to, to conceive a kind of, um, uh, if, if we can live in good faith with technology regarding ecology. And the fact that uh, uh, to, to, to include in any kind of uh, uh, technological plan we, we may have or we may use or technological uh, tools we may use to preserve the heritage, to including in this idea of worldwide heritage, the planet itself, because, because this is the, the, first, the first heritage above all. And uh, I think there is a, a big challenge. And again, UNESCO has a major role to play to think about how to conceive a, a technological progress with the sustainability. I think it's, 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 there is one, it's one key for me. And of course, a, a continent uh, like Africa has a lot to give us, has a lot to, we have to learn a lot from, uh, from Africa. This kind of balance between uh, an, uh, an uh, ecosystem, natural ecosystem, using and including technology. And I think we, we should, I mean, in my opinion, for these issues, one voice of Afri Africa is more important than the voices from the Western world. Okay, well, that's, um, that's an interesting way to put it. Um, yeah, so I, I was telling you that, yeah, it's, a, it's something that, which is, of course, uh, not exactly answering directly to the question, but I think for me, it's a, it's a key issue. The, the, the relationship between environment, sustainability, and, uh, and technology. No, no, I totally agree with you, right? So if we cannot live on this floating rock, um, then we, don't, we cannot do it, all the other things we plan to do. It's yeah. important, um, you know, making sure that we can live on the floating rock is, is also important. So I have, um, I have another question, my turn to ask you a question. How can African women play an active role in the next 50 years of digital heritage preservation, in your opinion? Sure, I think, I think there are two parts, and someone else has alluded to it, uh, the lady from Malawi, forgive me if I forgot to her name. One being the fact that um, for, for a lot of uh, cultural heritage, um, women or older women have been the um, custodians of, of, of that. And so being, being at one, being able to get the women to provide uh, with stories, be it, um, you know, insights into, you know, what, what, what our heritages are, that's important. Then on the flip side of that, um, I, uh, a couple of years ago, founded an organization called Women in Tech Africa, which brings up about 5,000 women across 30 African countries. And our job is to push the agenda of, of, of bringing more women into the technology space. So that's the other side of the conversation. It's not just that um, women are custodians of the heritage and a sense content providers, but that they are also building and redesigning the solutions. 
um, here, 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 just what we, what, what we said earlier might make sense, right? So if you've got somebody who is in the community and understands the community and understands the stories and the heritages in that community, when they are building to preserve the heritages, it's, uh, they, they come at it with a, a very different way of thinking about it. They come at it from a very nuanced way of thinking about it versus, you know, someone who's sitting somewhere that sort of come in and do analysis and, and, and design for heritage. And I think that's the important thing that we, we are not, that African women are not just custodians of the stories and the, um, and the heritages, but they're also the builders of the digital spaces in which we can preserve our heritage. Yeah. Now, I have, I have, a, I have a last question for you as around sort of creative industries, right? So there's a question around how creative industries can work more closely with, with heritage sector to, to in, in the digital sphere. Do you see any overlaps there? Do you see how we can work together to ensure that um, we can preserve our heritage? Yeah, I mean, you're touching probably one, one of the most important thing for an artist, actually, the, the, how to preserve also the, uh, the, the intellectual property in the digital mm -hmm. world. The fact that uh, uh, we, we uh, you know, uh, we are talking, when we are talking about world heritage, we are talking about uh, uh, tangible buildings and monuments, but actually what makes the, uh, uh, the identity of a community is also what I would call the un intangible uh, world heritage, what music, gardens, uh, literature, uh, movies, uh, what makes actually our identity as citizen of the world? I mean, to, uh, to, to be able to, to be felt and understood by the, by, by the outside world. And uh, then, of course, technology can help this to, to democratize tools for expression, to democratize tools for, for uh, uh, bringing culture to your own culture available to, uh, uh, to the world. And I, we, more than ever, I think we should, we should uh, really uh, uh, consider uh, culture as a Trojan horse for the outside world. And uh, I think that uh, uh, it's very, we have a, in this moment of disruption, I think we have an opportunity to use technology actually to, to give access for young generation to express themselves in a better way, to, to be less isolated. And uh, this is the best way also to, to uh, uh, to create a, a, a better consciousness about the importance of the, uh, the, the preservation of the world heritage, not only tangible, but also intangible. Right. I, think I, have to I have to stop both of you now because we're, we're sh a little short on time and it's been, oh, all you right. could go on and on because I know you, you have this vibe between you and you, you, you have a brainwave that you're getting each other and then it's great to listen and watch. I, I wish we could go on. So thank you so much, thank Ethel. You. And thank you so much, Jean-Michel. You know, you, you know we, we should, I'm sure, I'm sure that Ethel will be, uh, will agree with me. Uh, what, you, what you're giving us is the most frustrating exercise. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but you, I do it and I applaud you because it was, it was a great success. So you succeeded in the exercise and, and uh, well done. Well, both well, of you and all of, I want to thank all the panelists. Okay, what I wish, my wish is we can, we can in the near future having a, 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 quite a slight longer conversation, right? Yes, yes. yes. We'll arrange we will, it. We'll okay, take, take care of yourself, <laughs> Ethel. It's, it has been a real, we'll real arrange pleasure. It. Brief but intense pleasure. Thank you. Excellent. I want to thank all the panelists. I want to thank our audience. This was our second in our series of 50 Minds for the next 50. We're going to have our next one on the 20th of, no, 14th of June. So I, I invite everyone back to listen to that. But uh, to wrap it all up, I want to turn back to Ernesto Otone, the Assistant Director General for Culture here at UNESCO. Over to you, Ernesto, and, and I see Lazar Elundo Asomo is also uh, with us. So thank you. Go ahead. Merci, Rochelle. And as it was said by Jean-Michel et I, I would rather prefer to continue the, the dialogue because it was very enriching. Uh, thank you all for this uh, thought-provoking session. There was some provo provocation, and that's the, the, the best type of, of, uh, of dialogue that we can have. Uh, over the last two hours, we have discussed the opportunities, threats, and limitations of, 
of digital transformation for natural and cultural heritage. I will also uh, only mention some of the, the concepts that were uh, shared today. Rafik and Adol made the connection between data and heritage. Data is the footprint of humanity, data is a trace, not too different from finding something archaeologically. Witz Sisler reminded us the power of storytelling. Storytelling can greatly facilitate encounters with other places and histories and allow us to learn about different perspectives. Rachel Sibande has emphasized that women are custodian of culture, women are custodian of the heritage, and there are uh, sto um, storytellers. However, she also considered uh, and concerned that there are fewer women with digital skills. We need to reduce the cost of devices and data and offer digital skills training inclusive and conductive for women. Uh, Joanna Figueira raised how local communities can use technology to tell their own story and to protect their own heritage. Today, youth are sharing their culture and heritage of their ancestors using social media, amazing thousands of followers and making their heritage known. Echoing this, uh, Abel Abugait has mentioned that for people affected by conflicts, digital tools can be a practical tool to protect heritage. And we are looking at it uh, in some of the crises that, are we, that we are right now living. Uh, Kate Bonlongan, Chance and Rachel challenged us to consider how we may leverage the metaverse and the NFT designing experience in the digital world that can accessible to all, such as those with visual or auditory impairments, or those who are part of marginalized groups. Um, the, the last uh, dialogue that was, uh, and, and it's not the first time that I hear Jean-Michel telling us that identity uh, can help also uh, the digital tools to democratize more than ever, but is a Trojan horse, and I love this metaphor. Uh, it can help less uh, isolated people, and, and that we cannot separate the tangible from the intangible cultural for the building of, of what we believe should be the protection and safeguarding of the heritage for the future. So I try to wrap up, but the second session of the 50 Mind is part of the ongoing reflection process. For those of you listening from around the world, I would like to invite you to, to continue following our interdisciplinary dialogue in the coming weeks. The, 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 the discussion will be on heritage in the post-COVID world, sustainable tourism, balanced representation of heritage. I would like to finish by uh, the word of Anab Jain. The future is as much our heritage as the past. Knowing our heritage allows us to make better decisions about our future. So, once again, thank you very much to our fantastic thinker. It was really a pleasure to hear them all today and see you next week to continue these enriching dialogue. Thank you once again for all the participants and our moderator, but also all our 50 thinkers today. We have 10, we wait you next week. Thank you so much. <laughs>